You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back to another installment of How to Love Every Jew. So we spoke previously of the importance to desire to see the good in every Jew. That's number one, is you have to have a desire. You have to want to see the good in every Jew. And then you have to put forward an effort. You have to try. How do you try? You look into the depths of who the person is. Look at their goodness. Look at what they have good to offer. Everyone has something amazing to offer. When you focus on that, we'll succeed. But now there's a whole nother level we need to talk about. And that is to connect with the Almighty through this process. A person is inside this world, it looks like every person is a different person. We all have different faces. We all have different opinions. Like the Gemara says, Just like their faces are different, their opinions are different, their politics are different, their attitudes are different, their characteristics are different. We're all different beings. So the way we see the world is everybody's on for their, uh, they're out for themselves. Kol ish kemitziyut nefred. It's a different reality. Every person is a different reality. And that's what is the difficulty for each and every one of us to connect with another. Why? Because you're different than me. If you're different than me, then there's something, there's a separation, there's a barrier. In order to really, really, really connect with a deep love for every single Jew, you know what's required? The first thing you need to do is to have dvekut. Dvekut means a connection with the Almighty with no barriers. Do you know why we pray the Amidah prayer, the silent Amidah? What do we do in the Amidah? We meditate. Some people call it mindfulness. Some people call it yoga. You can call it whatever you want to call it. It doesn't make a difference. The idea of the Amidah, the silent Amidah, is to have a connection with the Almighty, a dvekut. Dvekut comes from the word like devek, to be stuck, to be close with the Almighty, that there shouldn't be a barrier between us and the Almighty. To feel a connection only with Hashem. That there's nothing in this world. And for a person to be fully connected and committed with, to the Almighty in every aspect. So that means a person can never really, if a person really has dvekut, if a person has real connection with Hashem, then there's no such thing as a temptation. Oh, I was tempted to go eat something that wasn't kosher. What do you mean? Hashem, you're right here. You're with me. I can't, I can't. Let me tell you a fundamental principle, okay? Every mitzvah aseh, mitzvah aseh, which is a performative mitzvah, is something that brings you closer to God. A prohibition, a mitzvah lo taseh, is a mitzvah that protects you from distancing yourself from God. The Torah tells us a prohibition not to eat non-kosher animals. Why? Because eating non-kosher food distances you from God. Will a lightning bolt come and hit you because you ate something that was prohibited? No. But what you're doing is you're cutting yourself off from God. It's, you're putting another barrier between you and the Almighty. And our sages teach us that food, for example, although food is nutrition, it sustains our physical body, but really it's the energizer, it's the, it's the power behind our spiritual soul. So what happens is if a person violates a prohibition of the Torah, what he's doing is, is putting a barrier, a michitza, between him and God. And that barrier will not allow him to connect to God unless, unless he repents. And the repentance removes that barrier. So I'll give you another example of a very simple prohibition. There's a prohibition in the Torah not to talk negatively about your fellow. Lashonara or Rechilut. 
or motzi shemra, which is one is untruthful tale on your fellow that's negative, one is a false tale on your fellow that's negative, another is peddling information about other people. All of these, you know what they do? They create a barrier between you and your fellow man, but they also create a barrier between you and the Almighty. And there's only one way to cure that. Number one is to repent and ask forgiveness from the Almighty. But in that case specifically, because it's dealing with a fellow man, you also need to get forgiveness from that fellow man. Because God says, if you haven't worked it out between yourselves, don't come to me to ask for forgiveness. You first got to work it out with your fellow. You speak negatively about somebody else. You got to go knock on their door. It's embarrassing. It's painful, but you got to do it. Last year, I had two experiences that were very, very special before Yom Kippur. I was talking about repentance and asking for forgiveness for things you may have done. If you hurt somebody, if you insulted someone, if you said something that was hurtful to someone else. So I had two people that I was involved with on a communal level, meaning I'm a rabbi here in Houston, they're a rabbi in other cities, and we got into a disagreement, a serious disagreement on communal matters. And I was a little forceful in my opinion, protecting my community, protecting our vibrancy, protecting our own interests in our city. But I felt that perhaps it was a little bit too strong. And perhaps I needed to ask forgiveness. It's a little embarrassing. And I got to pick up the phone now and call these rabbis. So what did I do? I picked up the phone. It was right before Yom Kippur. And I said, hello, Rabbi so-and-so. You know, it's okay for us to have difference of opinions. But perhaps I was a little bit too strong in my words to you. Perhaps I was a little bit too strong. And I want to ask for forgiveness. It's unbecoming. I shouldn't be talking like that to you. I shouldn't be so strong. You're a respectable rabbi in your city. And even though we all had the best interests in mind, perhaps I overstepped my place. And it's, it's very humbling. Do you know what came as a result of it? Exactly what the Talmud says, that when you, turn, when you do a sin and then you repent, the sin becomes a mitzvah. The relationship between me and these two rabbis became so close. We ended up talking for another hour on the phone, schmoozing, talking about this and talking about that. And talk. We became so close through the process. You know what? Sometimes you have to look at the picture and you say, you know what? I made a mistake perhaps. Let me go and apologize. And you make amends. Now you can come and talk to the Almighty and you can say, you know, Almighty God, look I made a mistake. I did something that I shouldn't have done, perhaps. But you know what? I worked it out with him. I need now your forgiveness. And then that's a whole new level. That's a whole new level that we can come and we can say, Hashem, it's not just I'm asking you for a freebie. You forgive me. That means the relationship. What's the whole idea? What are we talking about here? The whole relationship that we have with the Almighty is very connected to the relationship we have with our fellow man. Our sages tell us that the relationship that we have with our spouse is a reflection of the relationship we have with the Almighty. If we're selfish with our spouse, we're probably selfish with the Almighty. If we're giving with our spouse, we're probably giving with the Almighty. The idea here is that it's a a full package. So now let's go back to our topic where we're talking about loving every Jew Can you love every Jew if you don't have a relationship with God? You can't love every creation to its real, to the core of who they are if your relationship with God is is void, if it doesn't exist. Because what's at the core of every Jew? We said previously, we have a piece of God within us. That's what we're trying to connect to. We're trying to connect to that godliness that's within every single person. So he says, In order to connect to that true love that's within every person, you also have to work on your relationship with the Almighty. 
to feel just the godliness. To feel that there's nothing but God. What is worthwhile in this world that comes easy? Nothing. Any marathon, anything that you ever earned in life came with a lot of hard work. Right? You became a teacher, you became a doctor, you became a lawyer, you became a, a certified engineer. It comes with a lot of hard work. You have to take the tests and you have to study. Everything worthwhile is hard. By the way, you have wonderful children. Did that come easy? I don't think so, right? Came difficult pregnancies, difficult childbirth, raising children. Of course it's different. Everything is different. But the idea is that everything worthwhile comes with difficulty. You show me something easy, I'll show you how it's not worth anything. It's not worth anything. You work hard for something. Ah, it's usually the valuable things. I'll tell you, I, was, I, didn't, I never ran a marathon. I was supposed to twice. But during COVID, I was already all worked up. I was at the right weight. I was at the right pace. I was going to run the Jerusalem Marathon. And then March 2020, there was a, uh, a pandemic and the whole world closed down and the marathon was canceled. And then I just started eating. I'm like, forget it. But I can tell you that there were multiple times when I was practicing for that marathon that I was like, forget it. I can't. I can't. I can't do this anymore. And you're dripping sweat. And I'm running this by you over here six times every day. I'm trying to get my 20 miles. I'm trying to get it up to 22 miles and 24 miles because I... It doesn't come easy. How many times your feet are aching? How many times your back is hurting? And how many times you just, ah, oh, I just can't do it today. Anything worthwhile. So I have now, the, I need to get the bumper sticker 0.0 because I never ran the marathon. And after you feel that closeness with God in a real way, now you have to descend back to earth. Now that I feel that closeness with God, we have to descend to reality. Then you will be able to see that every single individual you see around you is a revelation of God in this world. You think that person who cut you off, the person who skipped the line at the bank, you, you skipped your line, the person who was being uh, mean to you in, in shul, you think those people are just random people? That's God's revelation to you in this world. That's God shining a light to you in this world. You have to just be able to see it with the right lens, the lens of godliness. The minute you realize that everything that goes on around you is godliness, nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. Every person you see is the light of Hashem. But you can't do that starting with humanity. You have to do that starting from, from top down. You have to start from recognizing your relationship with God. Sahara. Who doesn't love the Yetzahara? Yetzahara is everywhere. It's amazing. Amazing. Yetzahara does not give us a respite. He doesn't give us a chance to stop. I'll tell you, we started a new class on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Central Time with Rabbi Lazar Brody. And it was, uh, this week was our third week. That means it's locked in. This is our third week with this class as well. It's locked in. That's it. Put it on your calendar. We're locked in. So what happened? There were a number of technical problems to get the class started. I don't, what's the big deal? It's like, just get on Zoom, record, and go, right? It's not so difficult. Yetzirah didn't want it. And as soon as Rabbi, Rabbi Brody got on, there was a problem with the sound. We worked this out. We have like studio quality microphones. We have it all worked out, all in Ashdod, set up in his house. For some reason, nothing was working. As soon as we were able to get it to work, he says, you see how much the Yetzirah is afraid of what we're doing here? People are going to grow. 
people are going to connect with God. Yetzirah is not going to give you a free shot. You think he's going to just let you do it because you have a good desire to do something? He's going to get things in your way. He's going to suddenly, you're going to get an appointment that you didn't know about that you could cancel, but you don't want to because Yetzirah is going to find ways to block you from doing the good things that you want to do. It's very crafty. He'll always find a way to put a stumbling block. Always. And he's very good at it. So he says, what does the Yetzirah want to do? He's trying to confuse us. When he sees a Jew connecting with God in a real way, having this dveikos, what does he say? Let's just work together. Let's all be achdos. Let's be achdos. Achdos means achdut, right? To, to be friendly with one another. This is not proper. You need both of these toils, both of these works. It means number one, have dvekut ba'ashemit barach. Dvekut ba'ashemit barach means, I'll give you an example. There's something called, you know, this week we had a, a great guest in town. His name was Rabbi Chaim Kramer. Rabbi Chaim Kramer is the founder of the Breslov Research Institute. He put out about 80, 90 books in six different languages. It's amazing the work he's done. He's wrote, he's written himself 30 books of his own. Unbelievable, a real Torah scholar. I was talking to him on the drive when I picked him up from the airport. I was talking to him about different, different things. And he was like, yeah, that's the Gemara in Shabbos. And that's the Gemara in Erevin. And that's the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Like, like this. He knew every Talmud. Amazing. So he was talking about what does it mean to have dvekut. To have dvekut, this topic that we were talking about, dvekut means that there's no interruption between my relationship and the Almighty. There's no barrier, and there's nothing that gets in our way. Now, if you talk to the real Brestle of people, they'll tell you that a person has to serve Hashem 23-7. Now, what do we know? We know... What is it supposed to be? 24-7. What happened to, to the last hour of the day? One hour a day, Rab Nachman says, a person should do hitbodedut. Hitbodedut means to be boded, to be in isolation, to be just you and the Almighty. You see the problem, and this is why it's so important in our generation particularly, to do something like hitbodedut. is because we have these things, Everyone familiar? We have phones, and we have internet, and we have computers, and we have televisions, and we have, do people still do movies, VHS? No, they don't do that anymore, right? No more Blockbuster, right? It's like, people, because everything is so quickly accessible, everywhere, on our palm, on our fingertips, we have distractions left and right. One hour a day with no distraction. You know, you know what's amazing? Because this is known as a very common Hasidic way of serving Hashem. You do it bodadut. One hour a day. But I'll tell you a secret. My grandfather is not a Hasidic was not a Hasidic rabbi. But my grandfather in his yeshiva had a room which was the Hidbodadut room. And in that room there were no windows, there were no pictures, there were no Nothing. I walked into that room. I was in that room in his yeshiva in Beriakov. And you know what there was in that room? Two things. A chair and a light hanging down from the ceiling. That's it. There were three walls and a door. And there was a, a, a piece of paper on the other side of the door, on the outside of the door. And the students reserved half-hour slots to reserve that room. What's so important about isolation? The idea is because we have so many distractions, we don't get a chance to connect with the Almighty in a real way. Imagine you're trying to build a relationship with a potential spouse 
but without communicating. Just going to build a relationship without communicating. We all know that the only way to build a relationship is by communicating. So how can we build a relationship with God without communicating? It's impossible. We need to communicate with the Almighty in order to build a relationship with Him. It's true we have prayer. And prayer needs to serve as that. But there's another level where we're able to do this without any interruption whatsoever. We don't have a congregation there. We don't have words we need to say. We just connecting with God with our own words. That's it. Whole new level. When a person is able to connect with God and to feel that relationship with God on such a level, then we can take that to the next level. And that is, that oneness with our fellow man will be at its highest level when it comes after we built our relationship with God. When we're able to recognize the godliness that's in the world, the godliness that's within ourselves, the relationship that we have with God, and now we're able to see one second, every, every person has godliness within them. Every person, no matter what the struggle is, no matter what their challenge is, no matter how unsuccessful they've always been to anything they've ever tried to do, there's a godliness within every individual. And that's what we need to identify. Only after we have that dvekos, we have that connection, that oneness with God, then we can find the, the connection with every single Jew, which is our ultimate goal. So we mentioned last week, we have to desire it. We have to desire loving every Jew, then we have to work on it. But now he's giving the secret behind working on it. The secret behind working on loving every Jew is to build our relationship with God. That's the one ingredient that is required for each and every one of us to find the goodness in every single person. And it doesn't make a difference. I'll tell you, my great-grandfather, Avram Grzynski, he was the spiritual leader of the Slobotka Yeshiva back in Lithuania. Yeah, I don't know where it is today. I don't know. But I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. He was he was such a special man. Do you know that he worked on one trait, one trait of greeting every person with a smile, with a countenance? It took him two years. It took him two years to attain one trait. We think, oh, I'm going to be a kind person. Boom. I went to Rabbi Wolby's class. He talked about kindness. That's it. I'm a person of kindness. That's not the way it works. It's a lifetime of work. You see, someone who was such a holy person, such someone who was such a righteous person, it took him two years to attain one trait, to greet every person with a smile. And you imagine, it's Friday afternoon. It's all hectic in the house to have a smile for each of your children and for your spouse. Your neighbor comes to borrow eggs just at the wrong time. It's everything is flying with a smile at every moment. You know what it takes to do that? It's not to fake it. It's not fake it till you make it. To really internally realize that everything you have is a gift from the Almighty. And when you realize that everything is a gift from the Almighty and that every person you're going to meet is a messenger from the Almighty, how can I not smile? Right? So it's a lot of work to make that a reality. So I don't want you to think you're going to go home tonight and you're going to be like, wow, this is really special. Great class. I love it. Myerland Minion, awesome. Now I know how to love every Jew. It's going to be, it's a lot of work. That in every situation, even when you read stories in the news that are derogatory and he was proven guilty in court, it has to be. No, no, no. You can find a way to see the good in every Jew and to love them. You know, I can tell you stories of people you can read online why they sat in prison for many years. You see the story and he pleaded guilty. He pleaded guilty, said it has to be true, right? And I know the people are. I visited him. 
I visited them in prison. I asked them, what really happened? And the story is very, very different. So why did you plead guilty? Because they threatened me that if I don't plead guilty, they're going to give me life in prison. If I plead guilty, I'll get four years. So I did that. Or eight years. I didn't do it. And he has the proof for it. What are you going to fight them? But the whole world sees. And the whole world, we're all judges. You know the first Mishnah in Pirkei Avot? First Mishnah in Pirkei Avot. What does it tell us? Be patient in your judgment. So most people think and most people translate that it means the Bet Din. The Bet Din, the court, should be patient before they rush to judgment. They should hear both sides and they should deliberate. Sages tell us, each one of us are a judge. And there's a courtroom in our mind. And we rush to judgment. First thing you need to do, have him to nimbadim. Take it easy. Don't rush to judgment. You see somebody do something, take it easy. Don't rush to judgment. It's so important for us to realize we're living in a very polarized world, particularly politically. Politically, we're, it's such a polarized world. Oh, you voted for that? You voted for that? Ah, everyone... You're crazy. I don't want to talk to you. He's not my friend. I don't want to, right? I don't have anything to do with him. Obviously, he's crazy. Look at who he voted for. That's not the right way for us to conduct our lives with our fellow Jew. We have to recognize that everybody has a special goodness within them. I may not agree. It, it might not be my Shoresh sh- and it might not be the way that my soul is constructed. But there are 12 tribes. And the 12 tribes had different flags. And they had different qualities. And they had different virtues. And they had different blessings that they were given by Jacob. Everyone a completely different nature. Can we all just be the same? No. We're not meant to be the same. Imagine if everybody was a plumber. You wouldn't have an electrician. And you wouldn't have a dentist. And you wouldn't have a psychologist. And you wouldn't have an engineer. It would be be a crazy world. But how did Hashem create the world? Different tribes. Everyone has different things. And if you ask the computer scientist, would you ever want to be an electrician? He'll say, are you crazy? I don't want to touch that stuff. And if you ask a dentist if they want to be a plumber, they'll be like, are you crazy? Everyone's so happy in their own thing. But everyone's uniquely different. And everyone has different tools. And if you bring an electrician tools from a dentist, he's not going to be able to help you. Everyone has their own unique tools too. We need to realize that everyone is unique. And everyone is special. And we have to learn to appreciate the specialty of every human being. The best way to do that is by first building our relationship with God. Because when we build our relationship with God, then we're able to see that godliness in every Jew. We're able to see that spark within them. So even if someone is doing the craziest thing, like we mentioned uh, last week, all the extremists are Jews. We mentioned that, right? All the extremists. You think of some extremists, like, what's wrong with them? You're able to see, look at their mercy. Look at their compassion. I don't agree with it. But look how special it is. There's a godliness there. All right? So you don't, you don't have to vote the way they vote. You don't have to live the way they live. You don't have to act the way they act. But you have to recognize the godliness within each one. All right. So we're going to stop here. God willing, we'll continue. But I want to wish you all a safe summer, a healthy summer, a happy summer. And Bezat Hashem, a dvekut filled Summer, a summer where we're able to use this time that we have a slower schedule to connect with the Almighty and to bring God, godliness into our life and hopefully see that in every person around us. Amen. You've been listening to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast, a Torch production. Become a supporter at torchweb.org. 
because your assistance enables more Torah learning around the globe. To find more lessons offered by Torch, please visit torchpodcasts.com.